spreading out an aerial outside the rock, a bar-shaped aerial 5.48 meters long. Certainly, it would have been insane to install it permanently, even if they covered it with the best camouflage. The only solution was to spread it out through one of the hills at the moment of the transmission and remove it when the communication was over. This, as well as the searching of the area, posed a real risk for them, since the enemy could have listened to their conversations and tried to find them. However, those were risks they had to take. In mid-February, and in order not to waste any more time, Gambia Perry suggested that while one of his own men was sent from England, a specialist in transmissions from the garrison WT should immediately start the transmission tests with the recommended equipment and in the proposed way. The tests were done, and so it was possible to prove that the security service was incapable of detecting the transmissions. All in all, the mission had been planned out, and by the end of 1942, the place, the equipment, and the way of operating had already been decided. Then it was time to choose the most important element of the operation, the men who would carry it out. On the 25th of January 1942, the Chief of Naval Intelligence, Rear Admiral John Henry Godfrey, called for a new important conference to be held in London by the commands and the advisers of the Naval Intelligence to deal with the imminent launch of Operation Tracer. Under the chairmanship of Godfrey, four persons gathered together. Lord Horder, former doctor of the Royal House and intelligence officer, author of a thorough report on the operation. George Murray Levick, Surgeon Commander of the Royal Navy, whose experience in polar expeditions, including the ones led by the famous Scott, and long stays in isolated places, turned him into a useful and authoritative opinion to improve the operation. Colonel Cordor, and someone unknown called Ian Fleming, to whom the experiences of those years would be very useful in his future career as a writer. At that meeting, they dealt with very different matters, such as the uniforms and personal basic impedimenta for the mission, the kind of diet and the way of rationing the food and water, the consumption of alcohol and tobacco, and the total amount of food and different supplies needed. Among the hygiene-related matters, they talked about equipment and medicines, treatment of diseases, emergency surgeries, and even the possible death of one of the members of the group. Being isolation, the main principle to keep the secret, the solution in those cases could not be other than embalming the body and cementing it into the walls in situ. In order to do so, they had bricks and cement inside the cave. One of the most alarming questions in which Levick's experience was very important was the psychological resistance the soldiers needed to live for one year in isolation in a reduced space. One can only imagine what it must have been like to actually live inside this prison for about one year with five other men. Knowing full well that at any moment the Germans could storm into this room and shoot everyone as spies. Psychologically, it must have been hell. Clearly, all that was required was the recruiting of persons with certain stability and very special physical and, above all, psychic conditions. Furthermore, in the meeting they talked about the group's time management, the absolute and rational distribution of time, the way of dealing with leisure time, and the kind of reading material they needed to have, among other questions. Finally, although originally it had been considered that this first tracer team had to have five members, at this meeting they accepted that it needed six. An officer who would act as the chief of the group, three specialists in transmissions, and two doctors, all of them, of course, from the Royal Navy. In addition to getting from and sending to Gibraltar the required supplies, the Naval Intelligence Division would ask the Admiralty to choose the chief of the group and the specialists. The choice of the doctors was entrusted to Lord Morder and Levick. Finally, as it was an entirely new operation, Levick's suggestion was accepted. He thought it was wise to make a pilot rehearsal of the whole experience so as to prove the reactions of the selected staff. Although they thought of Scotland, 
where the British commandos and most official agents were traditionally trained, they finally chose Shotley Village on the east coast of England. On the 1st of March 1942, the Naval Intelligence told the First Lord of the Admiralty, Admiral Sir Alfred Dudley Pound, that his order was the only one remaining to begin the recruitment and training of the men. If everything went as planned, the first tracer team could begin its training in mid-May and two months later its operation in Gibraltar. Godfrey's trust in the success of the operation was so great that he offered to send the naval commanders of the threatened sensitive areas a manual with all the details and information needed to organize their own Operation Tracer. This manual, identified by the key ID 1001107-42 and camouflaged for safety reasons as suggestions to organize an expedition to the Arctic, is a valuable study of the operation as a whole. All the problems related to the building and adjustment of the observation posts, the selection of the staff, the lighting, the ventilation, or the hygiene-related matters are described in detail in 12 appendices that deal with even the titles of the books that the members of the group had to have in their bookcase. Once they were sure the secret observation post of the western axis of the Mediterranean had been launched, their next priority would be to do the same in the eastern axis. The chosen place was the British colony of Aden on the Yemeni coast, a strategic possession equidistant from the Suez Canal and India. While the British naval intelligence was mounting the operation, two events of particular importance to the development of the war took place. The first one was the defeat of the German lightning campaign at the gates of Moscow. The second one was the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which led to the United States definitively entering the war. Great Britain began to feel there was someone else there after so many years of apparent solitude. Though it was true that the paralyzation of the German advance to Moscow had destroyed the myth about the Wehrmacht's invincibility, both camps knew that would not remain the key defeat that put an end to the Russian adventure of Napoleon. Amid the snow, the German divisions had stayed on the ground and had contained the crisis. Nobody doubted the Germans still had enough reserves and morality to resume their attacks the following spring and end up winning in the east, perhaps in autumn 1942. There were still many months to go before the United States could deploy all its power to the Western theater of operations, especially because at that moment they had to face the unstoppable Japanese advance in the Pacific. Because of such an advance, the launch of Operation Tracer coincided with the seizing of Hong Kong, Malaysia, and chiefly the Singapore base, all British possessions, by the Japanese. The advance had been so quick that some people could do nothing but regret how useful it would have been if the Royal Navy had been capable of keeping one tracer team active in the occupied Singapore, even when suffering losses was never something good. In those days, Sir Dudley Pound himself wrote that, in the future, an operation developed from this model, Tracer, will have a permanent place in the defense of all the main ports. Regrettably, Singapore was already lost. But the first Sea Lord of the Admiralty confirmed the suitability of the highly innovative operation by approving the future settlement of tracer teams in Colombo and in the port of Trincomalee. Both of them were important enclaves located on the western and northeast coast of Sri Lanka, respectively. As regards the Mediterranean, the Admiralty's intention to establish tracer teams in the entrance and the exit of the Red Sea and on the island of Malta was facing growing difficulties. In spring 1942, Malta was being so persecuted that it could not devote any effort to the necessary retrofitting works. Meanwhile, in Alexandria, Port Said, and even Aden, the effects of the counteroffensive launched by Rommel by the end of January only gave way to rely on what could be achieved by the local deployment of the existing intelligence services. In addition to this, there were the consequences of a decisive German victory in the East and the crucial success of Rommel in North Africa. Taking this into account, it is easy to understand the naval intelligence's renewed interest in having a tracer team in Gibraltar as soon as possible. About a year after the caving group uh, discovered the, uh, the, the complex of, of rooms that uh, a gentleman, Mr. Dennis Woods, uh, was visiting Gibraltar and, and had obviously heard that uh, Stay Behind Cave had been 
uh, discovered and he made himself known to the uh, caving group and uh, it turned out that he was uh, a plasterer as part of the construction team uh, uh, that uh, were responsible for building the, uh, the network of chambers. He was led to believe that, that there was an Irish uh, construction team uh, had built the, um, the system of chambers um, but uh, other than that he was completely unaware of who or how or why or where and, um, and all, they were all shipped back to Ireland um, and uh, nobody was aware of anything. The recruiting of the members for the first tracer group began by the turn of the spring of 1941, even before knowing the identity of the officer who would act as the chief. These members were three leading signal men and two surgeon lieutenants. One of them was a 26-year-old surgeon lieutenant called Bruce Cooper, who had been enlisted in the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve before the outbreak of war. Cooper had had his baptism of fire as HMS Versatile's medical officer in 1940 when his ship was assaulted by the Luftwaffe while it was escorting the ship in which Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands was escaping. As he would remember over half a century afterwards, Commander Murray Levick, uh, he interviewed me and to start with it was very secretive about what it was about because it was so hush-hush. But uh, finally it transpired that I was going to get a job in Gibraltar, um, a cover job, but my main thing in Gibraltar was that if the Germans came over from Spain and took Gibraltar, I was to disappear up to the cave at the top of the rock and lock myself in. I, when I knew I was going to do this, I was asked by Murray Levick if there was another doctor that I would like with me. I, I said, well, there's Arthur Milner, but at the moment he is a medical officer at Lancaster Infirmary. When I rang him uh, and suggested that he join the Navy and join me, he said, I can't because I'm always seasick. So <laughs> Murray Levick rang him and said, if you join the Navy to join us, I will guarantee that you'll never have to go to sea. So he joined us. On the 30th of April, all members of the group, with the exception of the chief officer, were recruited. And under Levick's supervision, the training period started in the second fortnight of May in Shotley. Meanwhile, the Admiralty proceeded to gather all the supplies and necessary equipment in Gibraltar. As soon as the members of this first team had barely left Great Britain, the orders to initiate a rapid training of a second team were issued. On the 1st of August 1942, the Tracer team was established in Gibraltar under the supervision of the garrison's SO-1. At that time, this position was held by Commander Pike Knott. All members of the team were aware that, at any time, the operation could begin, and they would have to hide in the observation post 